What's up, Fungal Associates? Welcome to Completely Arbitrary, the podcast about trees and other related topics. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Alex Croson. And as always, we got Mr. KC Clapp. Hello, everyone. It's me, KC Clapp. I'm here with Alex Croson. Wow. Hey, Alex Croson. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, KC, we have some we have some exciting um, fungal associate news. Yes, we do. Which is that the Halloween just happened. It just happened. And um, we we got an, a notification on Instagram that mm-hmm. somebody dressed up as Casey Clapp and Alex Cross. Not only, not only right. one partnership, mm-hmm. two different groups of pairs, or rather, <laughs> two different pairs. <laughs> they, I can't believe this. What does that mean, Alex? Um, I don't know, but it was really surreal. Oh, yeah. So who, I, who oh, we they? have to shout out. Um, I have their handles, Yuffie Delight, who did a great job with uh, either. I'm I'm sorry if if they're not your partner, but there's another another person. Yeah, the the other the, we'll we'll call them the their podcast co-host. Yes, Yuffie Yuffie said that the Alex Croson to my Casey Clap. Oh, uh, they did a great job. This this other person who dressed up as me looks so much like me, <laughs> even like I mean like a younger me, right? Uh. Even in face. Uh, Incredible! They, I think they did like a face-off. Thing. Yeah, the other person got like a, a little bit of little bit of mustache makeup. Yes, so that yeah. was that was one couple, and the other couple, um, N N butts, excuse my French, eleven, uh, who dress up as you and I. Um, I love that. Just stunning. <laughs> I can't you, believe you guys that. did a great job. These are so these are so fun and so exciting. They even posed like us, Casey, with a cone like this. Uh, I'm beyond like. I don't. I feel like that means we've truly made it, Alex. Yeah, we're now we're now not only public figures, uh-huh. but we're public figures to be imitated. Next thing that the next the next sort of big get would be that if we were if you and I were like a popular like pinata at like uh, quinceañeras. <laughs> That's gonna be the next one. <laughs> You're right. That is the obvious, uh-huh. very clear step two from where we're at. Mexico just hates us for some reason and uh, wants to beat the shit out of us. It's because we brought up the idea that their their state national tree is an actual shrub. Right. But we agree with Mexico. We do. That. We agree with Mexico on this. Yeah. So I think that's fair. So they should be like, hey, um, but you guys should never have brought that up. But shout out to those people. They did a fantastic job. Incredible. Thank you so much. I am. I think we're beyond flattered. Oh yeah, definitely. It's insane. I was stunned. Well, congratulations, everyone. Yes, <laughs> we did it. Truly, congratulations. <laughs> Together, we all we all came out. We all came out for Halloween. Casey, the spooky season is over. It's true. No more pumpkins. That's right. No more pumpkin spices. You can still have pumpkin spice. No. What about Thanksgiving? No, it's over. Pumpkin pie. Nope. It's done. Okay. No more leaves. They've all, they're done. <laughs> right, yeah. They've changed the colors, and if they haven't changed colors, close your eyes. Don't pay attention to them. Don't look at them, don't talk about them, don't tweet about them, X about them either. <laughs> but one thing, no Tumblr posts, Nope. but one thing <laughs> that will never change is that today we are going to talk about a tree. That is true. That and, is timeless. And today we are popping bottles, Casey. Yes, we are. Because we are talking about the cork oak. That's right, Alex. Quercus. Suber, Suber, which I'm so happy that you you wondered because that this is I, we have a little etymology. Oh, lesson. exciting! Yes, and just as a little bonus, if you stay till the end of this episode, I'll tell you why we're popping corks. Oh my gosh! It's more than just a great reason to talk about this tree. Wonderful. Well, we got to do so, Casey. Got to do what? Talk about all those things. Oh yeah, yeah. After a break, let's do that now. <laughs> okay, and go. Welcome back to Completely Arbitrary. Today we are talking the cork oak. That's right. Now, Alex, uh, this is fun. Uh, so we'll just uh, let's just jump into this quick little etymology here. Okay. Because this Exciting. is called this is called the cork oak, and it's called the cork oak because it creates cork. Yes. So this is like a one for one, right? Yes. Like the cork that grows inside the cork oak is the exact same cork that we use to pin evidence of the who the serial killer is exactly all over our walls correct and draw strings between yes. the pins thank you yes yes it's also the same cork that you would have inside a cricket bat oh okay there you go 
<laughs> specifically cricket. Yes, yes, I learned this. Specifically cricket. Interesting. Bats. Okay. Also, it's the same cork that you would have inside uh rather not not inside, but it would make the sole of your sandal. Yeah, sure. It's also the same kind of cork that you would have in This is now the podcast. A bottle. Yeah. Just How naming many, what kind of cork? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Cork Talk. Here we go. We're gonna talk about cork and cork related <laughs> topics. I'm your Mainly host. Corks. Corky clap. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Alex Corkson. Uh, we could do that. That'd be great. So now let's talk about cork, Alex, because cork comes from Dutch and low German K O R K mm. cork, which comes from Spanish alcorque, which come which literally means cork sold sandal. Oh wow! Then Wait, that probably ooh. comes from Arabic all the and probably in a Spanish. Uh, Arabic origin, because did you know that Spanish and Arabic are like very uniquely tied together? Of course I knew this. I know you did. For those of you who didn't, it's because the Arabs came across Northern Africa uh-huh. at like one of the height of their their kind of empire spreading after the Romans and like in the kind of the Arab... Uh, when everyone was in the Dark Ages, the Arabs right. were like doing crazy in stuff. In their enlightened and, period. Exactly, which is why everyone's like, the Dark Period is such a Eurocentric thing. Yes. They had come over and gone up into Spain from Africa. Ah, yes. The Moors. Yes. And so the languages have a lot in common. Yeah, okay. Same thing with Portuguese. If you listen to it, it actually sounds a lot like Arabic too. Mm. So Cork, Q-U-R-Q or Q-O-R-Q, is based on the Latin Quercus, which means oak. So, cork I see. comes from quercus, which is oak tree, but it's also suber, which was Latin for the tree that is the cork tree. So, it is the cork oak oak cork. Yes. Like you said. Yes, exactly. But I think I edited that out. Oh, great job. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> yeah, that was a mess. I mean, no, this was my idea. <laughs> But anyway, I, I don't know. It's kind of interesting, don't you think? Like, Yeah, there's this sort of like circular... Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're doing sort of a figure eight with your hands, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a, um, a, fe- a positive feedback loop, you yes, know? Yes, yeah. It is, sort of, it is sort of like a current of electricity that's just sort of like feeding in on itself. Yeah. Of, I love etymology that's like that ends in just like a whirlpool. Like you can't really tell where it begins and where it ends. Yes, yeah, it's totally... And everything feeds into the other thing, which yeah. feeds back into that thing. It's amazing. Um, that's very interesting, Casey. It makes it feel like it's a, a real really good name you yeah. Know? yeah that's what there i was some I, thought uh, and history put into this name exactly yeah so and then and now we're just like cork oak huh that's funny <laughs> anyway give me the wine <laughs> but i did i did propose propose purport that cork quercus was related yes oh which, you did yes which good they job. are right yes but, they are but also kind of there's other reasonings too. Yeah, but it's a you you can draw a pretty easy line. It looks like, yeah. but it, in the etymology that I found, it did say probably. Oh, so sure. So there is a little bit of stretch from the Latin to the Arabic, back over and across up to the Spanish, up to the German, up to the English. Interesting. So, but honestly, over a couple thousand years and four or five, six different languages over those times. You can imagine where you could be like, yeah, probably. Yeah. You can't really 100% say. I wouldn't be surprised. It'd be quite a project, I feel like. I think it would be. But you know um, what? We got our best people on it. That's right. Casey Clavin, Alex Rosen. Uh, <laughs> Casey, let's imagine as we do every episode that you and I are in the Mediterranean. Let's proper, do it. And we come across some of these beautiful cork oaks. Oh, I'm let's, so excited. Uh, for our sandals, let's ID this tree. Let's ID this tree, Alex. So specifically, we would be walking around if uh, in one of two different places, most likely. If we are in Spain, it's called a dehesa. 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 Hmm. If we are in, or rather, I'm sorry, the Spanish pronunciation would be dehesa. What is that? That is the term for the woodlands that these trees are managed in and for. Oh. So they look like the same kind of thing you'd expect in Northern California where there's just oak trees that are not very tall. They're not like giantly super dense, but they just kind of have these boom, 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 wide open oak savanna like areas cool. with these big trees, but they don't get very tall. They maybe get 70, 80 feet tall max. Like that's max. They stay usually around 50 or 60 on average. Hmm. And they grow up and they have these big wide canopies that come outwards. So they create these like, 
short little stubby evergreen oak trees very much like i mean spitting image of the oak trees of california oh which is why we call that section of california southern oregon a mediterranean climate right same exact thing literally the same exact thing so kind of a big short sprawling oak yes exactly i'm also reminded of uh live oak it is, yeah. It's kind of like live oak, except it doesn't get as tall as wide. It's kind of like a live oak that's been like shrunk down. Okay. Yeah, so it's like a little smaller. And they grow in these open woodlands. If we are in uh, Portugal, we mm. would call these... Wow, they don't even have a name for it. You just <laughs> just silence. <laughs> they don't. No one knows. Uh, <laughs> no one knows what to call them. Yeah, they just are like, well, we, we, don't, we don't have a word for this. Um, they're called a Montaro. 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 And mm. I named those two places because Spain and Portugal are the two biggest producers of cork. Okay. Because this is the, the habitat where the cork oak grows in these big woodland areas. Neat. Along with the holm oak and the Iberian oak and the maritime pine, Italian stone pine. But you can find them growing in North Africa also. So this sort of southwestern Europe, northeastern Africa is their their most populous region. And then as you go around the Mediterranean, just kind of encircling it, they grow kind of in the, the drier but still kind of humid and moist areas. They get uh, nice amounts of rain right around the ring of the Mediterranean. Interesting, Casey. Can, I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm tempted to... To say, hey, let's save the bark for last. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yes. So definitely. maybe we should talk about leaves. The leaves, Alex. Evergreen oak. A beautiful Love evergreen it. oak. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, if you're in the United States, probably in the northeastern United States, many people think that oaks are just big, gigantic, deciduous trees. Sure. They are not. Yes, there Ma are evergreen oaks. Exactly. I think, actually, I would probably wager that majority of oak species are, in fact, small, shrubby very uh, scrubby evergreen species. That is very interesting. Yeah. Because there's a lot. A lot of them actually stay as shrubs. Some of them grow as shrubs for like the first several years of their lives and then just like out of nowhere send up giant shoots. It's kind of like they're building up a big root system and then they come up and then they grow up and out. They don't get very tall. They're very mm. small, medium-sized trees. Yeah. This is the same for the oaks in the southwestern United States as well as all these oaks down in the south of Europe and North Africa, but they grow these leaves on these very furry, furry shoots, and the leaves are kind of cupped a little bit, and on the edge of each one of their veins are little points, so they kind of look like a holly leaf in that regard. I will say this leaf, for not being uh, what I consider to be a traditional oak leaf, is quite quite comely. They are. They're very lovely. I, I adore that term, comely. I think that is... I hope I'm using it right. I think you are, but it's kind of... <laughs> You know what? Let's not look it up just to be sure. <laughs> and if someone else uh, is like, actually, you're using it completely wrong. That's okay. That's just like your perspective, man. You try talking on a microphone for two <laughs> hours every day. Uh, yeah, they're 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 a decent looking leaf. Yeah, and they uh, they're they're very pubescent underneath, oh, which wow. I do like. So if you have the <clears throat> if you flip one over compared to the top, they're very contrasting with this light pubescence versus this kind of kind of green it's not a shiny green it's kind of a dull light green on top mm -hmm. this white kind of um pubescent underside which i should note the pubescence on the twigs the pubescence on the leaves that is all related to its dry mediterranean habitat mm. so it is adapted to these warm, dry conditions. And a lot of times, any plants that have these little pubescence along the base of their leaves, it's them making a teeny tiny microclimate underneath those little hairs that help keep it just a little bit cooler. Oh. It's very, uh, very common in different plants in these dry areas. Interesting. Yeah. I kind of I kind of saw it as like moisture wicking or something. No, no, it actually kind of keeps moisture there. Well, there you go. Well, let's talk acorn. Oh, Alex, um, have you looked him up? What a dandy little Aren't guy. Aren't they just the cutest little things? <laughs> I love them, Case. I think they're adorable. <laughs> they cover, uh, they're, they're these little caps with these long acorns that are very pointed that come out. And they're like, I don't know, maybe the cap covers a, a quarter or a third of the whole acorn itself. But they're just like, they're just so quintessential. They're yeah. just adorable. They're a little bit more elongated than what I think a lot of people are used to. But 
like if you're in Northern California, that is what an oak acorn oh, looks like. Oh, okay. Like they're just these long, skinny little things that yeah. pop out. The the caps are also uh, I. They're not hairs, but they're like these little tendrils that yeah. pop out. And those tendrils actually are only when they're young. As they age, they kind of become these little nubs. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because I also like a mop saw head. I'm going to call it like a mop head. Yes, it is. It's similar. But what's curious, Alex, is I looked this up, and the like botanical drawings do not show those long tendrils. Interesting. So I'm not sure if it's just a very young one that is kind of growing and then those little mop heads kind of just like suck down and then just kind of have their their tips point out or something yeah i'm not sure huh but i don't think that that is a 100 percent thing there's another oak tree it's called the uh quercus serrata i know serulata and it is the sawtooth oak Mm -hmm. and it has like a super mop head acorn cap interesting like it's wild so i'm not sure if I don't want to say 100% one way or the other, which is why I'm a little waffly right now, because I think that you can find them both depending on the amount of maturity Hmm. of that acorn. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Excellent. I love when that happens. It's one of those, one of those things that we've talked about trees that have like, I'll be like, oh yeah, it has orange bark. And you're like, "Mm, not really. Mm, Kind of. And I'm looking at like a young (laughs) Uh, like a sapling of it, you yeah. know, it's like one of those yeah. things that you, they'll grow out of it. It's just a phase. Exactly. It's just a phase. It's going to be fine. <laughs> just, just don't worry about it. Just lead them along the right path and they'll get through it. <laughs> well, Casey, we've come to the, we've come to the crown jewel of this tree. Haven't it's, we? It's namesake after it all. It is. It's name's namesake. Which is the bark, the oak bark. Mm. Can I, can I say, <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking at a few photos of, cork oaks that have been harvested for their bark yeah <laughs> aren't they weird i'm i'm reminded of the 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 banner of the uh the boltons in oh, uh, the game of thrones f- the, the flayed, flayed man. man yeah yeah oh that's a good one <laughs> a little dark but uh this is this is the flayed <clears throat> oak oh the my flayed god oak yeah Wow, that is like so accurate. You you nailed it. <laughs> it is exactly right. However, we should note that the bark of this tree is that outer section. Mm-hmm. And technically, what they are doing is harvesting the bark. But let's take one step back first. Okay. The bark is cork. The thing that you are thinking in your brain yeah. right now, you mean that kind of cork? Yes. Yeah. I mean exactly that. But not the very outer outer uh, layer, right? Uh, like the thing we see if we look at a cork oak and we yes. look at the bark. Yeah. It's going to look like tree bark. No. It's, it's going to look like cork? It's going to look like cork because it kind of splits and kind of curls oh. in those those ridges in the, the furrows kind of between the split. Uh-huh. Just like you see any other big oak tree growing out and it has these big kind of furrowy dark, uh, dark bark with these individual furrows between. Yeah. Those are, it's just essentially a thick bark that is made of this very specific substance called suberin. And suberin is a fire-resistant, water-resistant chemical polymer inside the bark. It's in almost every single tree, Hmm. which is why we call that section the bark cambium that grows the bark in a tree. We call it the cork cambium because it is producing this substance that we call cork in the titular cork oak sure so the bark itself you can see that it looks just like cork yeah you can feel it and you're like this feels rubbery and corky it just so happens this tree has produced way more than most other trees as an adaptation again to fire because it's big and thick and fire resistant so fire just kind of goes along it the tree even if it loses its branches and some twigs it just regrows because the main kind of column stays alive underneath the insulation that is the cork oak bark the cork is wild yeah the cork is the cork is off the chain, man. It's so beautiful. Alex, have you seen one of these trees in, in uh, person? Not IRL, no. Oh, I literally passed one on my way to your house. Did you really? Yeah. I'm looking at a photo of a man harvesting some bark. Yeah. And it looks like he scored yep. scored the bark to make it nice and easy. And it looks like he's like he like he's opening a, a door. Yeah. On the on the side of the tree. <laughs> this is this it's, is it's like it's like uh what what do you what do you call that uh fake like when you put grass down on a on a lawn oh, like sod like sod yeah. yeah 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 
It's exactly what it looks like. It's wild. So what they've done is they the, they let these trees grow up, and this is kind of a, an important part of this. So what it is, is it is the bark of the tree. It's made of this certain substance where mm. you can imagine the tree, for whatever reason, just started to just put out so much more suberin than any other tree. And that was an adaptive strategy that ended up saying, hey, this is actually really good for me withstanding fires. So it grows and grows and grows. It gets really big. As it grows, just like any other thick barked tree, the the bark gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So what they've done in this flayed man tree yeah. is they... I had to watch a couple of videos, which are so interesting. These people are some of the most skilled people I've ever, ever met in my life. Wow. Because I guess I technically haven't, quote, met them. Spiritually. But we're in the internet age, right? Yeah. So you're familiar, Alex, with the cambium layer of a tree, correct? Yes, I am. Yes. uh, Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. No further questions. (laughs) I can see the judge isn't the one asking the questions. (laughs) Uh, Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I'm just just a lawyer over here. Don't worry about it. They, um... So the cambium is a, is that layer of living cells underneath the bark outside the wood yeah. that is the vascular system of the tree, right? Yes, between the between the bark and the and the tree. Correct. The wood. The rather. wood, yeah. So <clears throat> if you cut into that and you take away all of the bark and you'll kill, you will kill that cambium layer. Mm-hmm. It'll dry out and it won't be able to function and the tree above it will die because it's not getting any water and the space below it will probably die or at least significantly be hindered because it's not getting any of the photosynthesis uh photosynthate rather. Yeah. It's going down. Yeah. So that's called girdling a tree. Very very quick and easy way to kill a tree. It's essentially cutting its head off but you just go around the outside. Damn. So these people have developed a technique to cut into the bark and pull it off just down to the essentially closest layer to the cambium Wow! without actually going any further and killing the tree. Damn. So everyone has had this- Surgical. It is like mind-blowingly surgical, but they're doing it on- like trees that are a meter thick. Wow. This is the interesting thing. They go and harvest these trees on a rotation of about every nine to 12 years. The tree's planted, it grows up to about 25 years old, then they harvest it and they call that the virgin uh, initial cut. Hmm. And that's very low quality cork, oak. Cork, nice. (laughs) So- that's low quality because the tree is still young. It's also a small diameter. So at that small diameter at 25 inches, when you take that bark and you put your fingers together in like a cylinder and then you keep your thumbs together, but then you flatten out your hands, then you, you, know, you can't do it 100%. But that is what they're doing with all of these, uh, the, all the cork that they pull off, all that bark. Hmm. So they take it out and they put it in a press, like a, a cement press. They leave them there for a couple months to let them like dry, and uh, they also like boil them to get any maladies out and things like that. And then they flatten them out. They essentially get steam flattened. Wow! But that is of lower quality because the bark isn't as thick. And when you flatten it out, you're essentially taking something that was grown as a circle and making it flat. Sure. And it just doesn't really hold together. It breaks apart a lot. And there's a lot more gaps that you can kind of find. So air gets into whatever it is you're trying to cork. So that's virginal cork. Yes. Call that virgin cork. Okay. So then nine to 12 years later, as the tree grows in diameter, um, just like the earth, once you get to a gigantic diameter, mm-hmm. uh, the the circle, the outer side of the circle is essentially approaching flat. Oh. So the bigger the tree- You heard it here first, Casey's a flat earther. I'm a flat earther. <laughs> okay, you guys, you can admit that at least the earth is approaching flat. <laughs> I see, Casey. So it's so it's the circle that that is the diameter. Excuse me, the circumference of the tree trunk. Yes, is so is so big that one section of it is almost flat. Exactly, making it much easier to go through this flattening process. Precisely, so where it doesn't break and become brittle. Yes, and then you get a higher quality That's material. The, that good cork. Exactly, okay. and then. This is the best part. So it's like a it's like a sheet almost. Like maybe it's about an inch or so thick. And they take that sheet, they flatten it out, uh-huh. and then they cut it on a bandsaw. And then they lay those bits down and they go through it 
essentially, if it's on the tree, they are cutting into it vertically. So longitudinally, if you take those oh, sheets, sure, yeah. yeah, yeah, take those sheets, you flatten them out, then they're going down through those sheets, and that's how they make the corks. It's like cutting it's like cutting a hoagie roll for a sandwich. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then you're going sideways through the hoagie roll down the length of it yes. to get the uh, hoagie corks. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. A nice nice Italian hoagie Italian cork. Sub. Yeah, I get a hoagie cork every time I eat a uh, <laughs> <laughs> Philly cheese steak. I love the idea of you being like a one-liner guy, but yeah. they never quite land. I'm just so they just bad. Just like take too long. <laughs> what is he going to say? Oh, that was funny, man. If he just had better timing, that would have been really funny. Hey, anyway. Casey, what's the difference between a good joke and a bad joke? Timing. <laughs> that was good. <clears throat> That's really interesting, Case. Yeah, it's a very interesting process. I mean, it's almost like. I feel like I, and I, I don't mean to disparage the talents of these cork harvesters, yeah. but I do feel like I could have come up with that. Do you know what I mean? Oh, totally. Like it's, it's a very straightforward process and it that's is, not to yeah. say anything about like the technical skill it takes, Yes, yeah, but yeah. it is very much like if I were to, if I were tasked to harvest oak from this tree or a uh, cork from this tree. Yeah. I would probably come up with something kind of similar. Yeah. No, it is a very intuitive process. Yes. You're intuitive, totally right. Yeah. But I think you're exactly right. I know you're right because I've watched the videos. It's the skill to execute that intuitive yeah. process because you can't go too deep or else you kill the tree. Right. If you kill the tree, you have killed your your like livelihood. It's like surgically removing like a pork loin without killing the pig. It's kind of wild. Well, I think it's actually more akin to uh, shearing a sheep as uh, opposed to skinning a sheep. Ooh. You skin the sheep, the sheep's dead. You shear it, it'll grow back, and you can keep shearing it over and over. If you're precise enough, you can remove the skin without harming the animal. <laughs> Trust me, I do it all the time. <laughs> the animals don't complain at all. <laughs> and then from there, Casey, what? They, they, they sell to... Is this an industrialized process? Like, are there orchards and orchards and orchards? Casey is oh my aghast. God. Okay, tell there me. Are, there are... <clears throat> so, it is... A billion dollar industry. Are you kidding? No, no, more than for billion. cork. Fifteen billion cork stoppers made every year oh. to supply the international market. And this, I believe, was written in two thousand one. I was thinking, what could be popular enough to make an entire industry out of this one material? And of course, it's wine. I was gonna say, did you come up with anything? <laughs> <laughs> it's, wine, it's wine, champagne, I forgot. yeah, of course, and all the other things that we talked about. All those other products. Sure. I'm sure, I mean, the sandal market is not quite as hot as the it's wine. Not, yeah, it's not quite there yet. Yeah. The wine so, market. You know, but there, we're still building that up. And all comes from this one species, huh? Literally. Okay. There are no other species that I am aware of that we use for natural cork. And it's not, It's mm-hmm. is it this thing where, um, you know, I'm thinking of like the Japanese, uh, uh, shit, the Japanese um, cherry, right? Yeah. Where it's like a million different varieties. So whatever ails you, you can find a cherry that's good yep. for you. Is it? Is it like they've bred these to have extra thick cork? No. It's just natural. It's just natural. It, this is this is mm-hmm. this is as close to like a real, like sustainable natural practice. I'm so happy, Alex, that you said that. Wow. And everyone, ladies and gentlemen, I promise you, I did not prompt him to <laughs> no. do this. There's no sign being like, <laughs> say the word sustainable practice, Alex. <laughs> no, this is, you are 100% right because this tree is adapted to growing down in these lands. They're arid lands, though, like Northern California. So if we were to transform them into something else then we are throwing the whole habitat out of whack yeah if we cut all the trees down and we just graze it turn it into a big farm then we're no longer having the different animals that used to live there <clears throat> you're not supporting the different people because you have one giant rancher who's running one giant ranch for one animal you know mm. it's the american way that we do things sure we will industrialize in one way for one thing and then we will throw everything so completely out of balance that we have to keep on adding the other things in to bring it back into balance. But we're not really, we're just holding off the tide of pests that are coming in. The factory farm mentality. Exactly. So here in these two places that, uh, that I talked to you about, the uh, Dehesas mm-hmm. and Monta- Montato, they are these two like 
historic cultural landscapes that are basically protected. Good. And I say basically because the trees, at least in Portugal, are absolutely protected. You can't cut one of these trees down without permission from like the Department of Agriculture. Oh, I'm reminded of sandalwood, Casey. It's exactly the same thing <clears throat> because this is such a huge part of their economy. Yeah. They are the only places. They make something like 70 or 80% of all of the cork in every <sighs> bottle in every part of the world. Wow. Yeah. It's a huge, oh my huge God. amount. And they work these lands in a way that is so unique, but so like very dumbly obvious. Mm. So real back, back in the Roman times, they really started to like Here put this go. together. Anyway, so Caesar came in. Casey found a way. <laughs> Actually, someone else did. I'm just, I'm just a, I'm just a messenger here. Okay, just a messenger. <laughs> Much like Hermes. Uh, <laughs> Interesting. Wrong, Interesting. <laughs> wrong era. Sorry. <laughs> so they, uh, back then, the Romans created this insane amount of. The best way to put it is just enterprise. So mm. they were making stuff, and they needed bottle toppers to put into their bottles of wine and other things. They didn't have very much glass though. Glass was probably one of the highest, fanciest, expensive things you could ever get. Wow. But they did make a lot of stuff out of different kinds of ceramic processes. Sure, clay and... Yeah, exactly. We're still finding those pots all over the place. That's right. So they would found, they found that you could take this cork stopper and you could put it on top and it would keep out water, it would keep out air, but it would let in just the right amount of air through the lenticular channels. Or, wow. You know, you know what that uh, that what that comes from? Lenticel. Exactly. Yeah, gas it's exchange. A, exactly it. But it's just the right amount in high quality cork that lets in just this perfect amount to keep the the process of uh, fermentation and you know aging like working nicely, yeah. but not enough to turn it into acid. Wow. So it's this really interesting, like perfect material if it's high quality low quality cork tends to not do that again for the reasons we talked about mm. higher quality cork does it fantastically wonderful so after the romans kind of petered out let's say <laughs> glass didn't really come back onto the scene until like the 1600s or something like that oh wow so then really? this whole process yeah this is what i read no middle age glass out there i don't think there was in this, churches yeah I, I maybe in churches so there there would be like Again, this fine, high, uh, high class stuff that you could buy, high but glass. It, it wasn't. Oh, very high glass. Yeah, was, mm, quite. Sorry, that wasn't worth it. But there's just not a lot of. Uh, there wasn't a lot out there for the the, the plebeians. Right? Sure. So what they ended up doing is revitalizing this this use, and they have in, industrialized it in a traditional, sustainable way. Mm. So Cork, from what I read, actually, I think I saw this on a Business Insider video, wow. in case you're interested. They said that the Cork oak tree has been protected in Portugal since the 6th century. Oh my God. Like, but back then, it was like, you know, you had your royal people being like, royal decree, thou shalt not cut down this tree or else we'll cut your heads off. In the king's forest. Exactly, exactly. And the king's forest was everywhere. Right. So there ended up becoming this unique balance that people developed. They are managing this land, not intensively, but very intensively. Hmm. So it's not managed intensively as in they do every little teeny tiny thing. Sure. It's just, they don't leave it alone. Nothing is there strictly by accident. Yeah. So they will plant new trees when old ones have to be cut down or die. Those trees grow up and they protect them from animals because they have animals, livestock out here all the time. They have pigs that eat the acorns and fatten them up for hmm. harvesting. And they have this very fancy Spanish and Iberian Peninsula meat that you yes. get, ham. They have... I Iberian pork. Yes, exactly. You've world heard of it? famous, of course. Oh my God. Yes. I should have known you would know this, Alex. Oh yeah. Well, I'm a big fan. This is where it comes from. They fatten it up off the acorns of this and all the other oak trees that are kind of in these oak woodlands. Mm. Then they have cattle wow. that graze on the grasses underneath the oak woodland. They have sheep that also graze, and then oh they sh God. shear the sheep, and now they have clothes that they're making. Wow. They, because they have left all of these native trees mm -hmm. to grow in this woodland area, there are native insects. And of course, famously, Oak trees are very good um, habitat for insects, specifically mm. arthropods and little worms. That brings in birds. 
because there are um, all these different habitat things that are going on, all these like wide open prairies, you have mammals and rabbits. And there is a Iberian lynx that apparently is either right on the verge of being an endangered species or is an mm. endangered species. It's very rare. That lives in these areas wow. because rabbits are constantly living, eating on all the little things and all the native shrubs and grasses that are in this area. Then you have this endangered eagle that also stays and hangs around because it can eat all of those other little things that oh are God. also down the ground. So it's this full ecosystem that is supporting all these local farmers. It's supporting this gigantic industry. Yeah. And it's different than what we would do in other forest resource extraction spaces because the forest product comes from and is dependent on a living tree and unhealthy ecosystem. Yeah. Versus like removing all the trees, coming back and then replanting. Now that land has to recover for who knows how long and you destroy the ecosystem. In this place, in these situations, they are keeping the ecosystem intact and using it with multiple different things that we now today colloquially call diversity. Right. And the ecosystem stays in balance. Because it's because they took the, this is this is um I feel like this is a great this should just be like template for any yeah. like natural resource industry. Mm -hmm. It's like let nature dictate how you go about harvesting this stuff. Yeah. And you can manage it. You just can't manage it and force it to something that it doesn't yeah. already want to do. Yeah. Well, Alex, there's a term for this. We call it agroforestry. Oh, sure. So it's the idea that <clears throat> you are planting things and trees to grow in certain ways in certain places for multiple different objectives. And it goes from like certain trees that give a certain thing down to the smaller trees that grow in shady conditions down to shrubs and herbs that you then get livestock to eat. You run them over a very large, vast space. So you're never having too much concentration in one area. Yeah. Recovery and uh, rehabilitation is happening all the time, just like in any normal ecosystem. And you're exactly right. Nature is dictating what works best. And then we're just moving the dial a little bit here and there to make it work efficiently for us. Here's my question. Why? I'm like, very. it's almost like, it's almost like, it's surprising that this, this is the way it's done. Yeah. It's very enheartening, mm -hmm. you know, heartening. Yeah. One of the two. It's, very, it's, it makes my, it makes me happy. I think heartening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, hmm, what's the catch? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, why isn't it a huge destructive factory farm industry? Mm -hmm. It's because the trees do not grow that fast. Okay. And if you can manage for all these things, then you can wait the nine to 12 years, mm -hmm. harvest these trees sell the cork and do this on a long rotation. It's also been very traditional for a very long time. So before like industrial capitalism really got its hold on things, yeah. this was already a sustainable working practice. It's a native tree, but you can't grow bark any faster than you can grow bark. Yeah. So they have to wait this X amount of time. And in order to just use the land that's being just you know, kind of waited on to wait for these trees to get big enough and the bark to regrow, they would just run their livestock on it. And then they would do that and just keep everything just the way it was because it was working just fine. The trees are growing just fast enough and you have just enough of them over this big wide space that you can you can make it sustainable. So yeah. it's really like low intensity over a very large right. space. Whereas what capitalism <laughs> is all about is very high intensity yep. on the smallest space. And I, and I want to say like, that's such a beautiful template. Right. Yeah. And like, Oh, I wish we did that here, but there's just absolutely no fucking chance that that would play in America on yeah. mass. You know, yeah. like I'm sure there are communities that like we have sustainable practices for harvesting this plant. Mm -hmm. Um, they put some thought into it, but that has to be the minority. Yeah. And I think it also needs to come down to a local market. A lot of the big thing with this catch is that it's the people who are eating and producing these goods are right there. Yeah. We were talking, um, a couple weeks ago with, um, 
Shannon of the uh, of the Lumber Update. Yeah. Which I don't think it's come out yet, so everyone will hear it. We'll post about it when it does. But he uh, was talking about going over to Europe, to Austria, and was saying, yeah, they cut down the trees. The people that do all the work and all the things are right there. Mm-hmm. It's, it's one small community that's sure. serving itself. You saw the tree that got cut down. Ten minutes later, you see the boards that the guy's selling over here. Not in the way that, like... Uh, and if anywhere in the United States, if you take a bite of corn, it's coming from like this yeah. one farm in Ohio. Yeah, right, or wherever. <clears throat> yeah. So this would be the case of saying, great, let's do that, but instead of buying my eggs at the multinational chain that I get my eggs from, Mm -hmm. I will go to the local market in my community and get eggs from the farm that has chickens that lay eggs that also grow all these other things. I also wonder what that says about the Portuguese and Spanish people, you know, like in terms of like their culture at large, Mm -hmm. if they just value like more hand handmade, more artisanal. um, I mean, I, the, the, that can be certainly said, be, that can certainly be said about food in Europe in general. Yeah. Maybe except the UK. Sorry, everyone. Wow. Um, where like, you know, f- uh, food is named after the cities where it was made. You know? Oh, yes, I see. Yeah. Um, and that I think you're right. Now, I don't know, and I don't want to necessarily romanticize, you know, the this European ideal of pastoralism because there are still giant cities that are filled with all these different things. Sure. So... I, I'm, I'm speaking in generalities. Casey. Yes, I know, and I'm just I'm just calling out those generalities. Okay. Is all. Yeah, because it can be done. The United States is so far away from that model. That, so far away that it when we are even talking about kind of getting towards that model, we're just like, oh my god, they're right. doing it. It's beautiful. So I I think that they're you know if we were talking to someone from a city in Spain, they'd be like, no, dude, this place is so messed up. But then there's other things that they're just way more progressive about, Mm -hmm. which is funny to say is progressive because it's actually a traditional way of managing the land that goes back thousands of years. Farmers markets are a great example of of this kind of thing happening. Um, CSA, CSA community supported agriculture. Exactly. So this is the model is there and we can do it, but you need to, it needs to be supported it's a little bit more expensive because it's far more intensive these are literally 12,000 people every year going out into these forests and removing the oak or the removing the bark off of these trees by hand this is not a machine process a machine would kill all of the trees yeah the, the trees are not perfectly straight columns so everything has to be done by people that I think is the big thing that we have gotten away from yeah. where we're, we're not having people go out and do these things. The farm jobs kind of suck if all you're doing is just walking through literally miles and miles of soybean and corn farms. That is not going to be a very enjoyable job. Big, huge farms of only one thing may not be an enjoyable job. But if you're on a farm, it's a big farm, but you have like 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 different kinds of things growing at any one given point in time. The diversity at least makes it a little more interesting, maybe. Yeah, I, I think it's hard to I think it's hard to convince Americans to buy like CSA stuff or farmers market produce yeah. because, um, in a I don't know in a culture that that puts such a high value literally on money. Yes, or like, funny enough, a high value on low value. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Oh, that's only seventy nine cents. Yeah, yes. I'll take them. As opposed to the corn over there, that's a dollar thirty. But it was it was grown with care and like on a small farm, and it was hand delivered to the to the stall. Yes, and someone um, multiple people got paid from that dollar thirty. Yeah. Not just, you know, one machine and one farmer or something. So many people would rather have the corn that's 30 cents cheaper because, yeah. you know, well, well, that that also goes, I mean, like, you're not getting paid enough to, not, not everybody is paid enough from their fucking full-time job to be able to support the CSA. Yeah. So what I'm hearing, Alex, which I, I think is like so key to this whole conversation is like how complicated it gets so quickly. It's true. In the United States, like we've gone so far down a certain route yeah. that it's hard to come back. So when we look at this, like we said, we see it and we're just like, Ah. Yeah, you turn around to look at the path and it, there's immediately a bend in yeah. it. And you're like, oh, I don't even know where we came from. Right. But I think what we can say pretty emphatically is there. this is a model that we can use and should be used and is mostly used in places where the arid or the land is very arid and you can't grow a lot of stuff. So they have to have these certain things in place. Yeah. A lot of the, the kind of warm tropical areas are really focused on agroforestry. 
And it is, it is a multiple use strategy, but you, it just, it just does not fit capitalism. Like that's the really big thing is that we have designed everything to fit our capitalist model, which is maximize and minimize on these two different sides. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is kind of like, why don't we just, why don't we just like not maximize anything yeah. so that everything is kind of running at a sustainable rate? Balance. Balance. Wow. All about balance. What a concept, Casey. What a concept. Oh. So if we can do it here, man, what, what, a, what a dream that would be. That would be amazing, Casey. I mean, you have to have hope, right? I've, yeah. Uh, and everything, everything is a rubber band. If we go too far in one direction, the rubber band will snap. Mm-hmm. I, it'll either snap or rubber band back in the other direction. Yeah, right. Um, you know, even the mightiest empires fall. True. And we're on our way. We're on our way. Fingers crossed. The- <laughs> <laughs> so hopeful. Yeah. Well, and see, in that regard, it, like a big counterpoint would be, is that system, is this system of these kind of big, they're not even really estates. Some of them are like locally owned by like a group or a co-op or or they're just public land that are managed specifically. Interesting. You also can find that someone could say, well, how many people will that support? It's in balance, but we have a city of 2 million people over here that Mm. need food. You cannot grow enough food to support this number of people on this system. So there's this other, that is the the pendulum swing. Yeah. I mean, everything is more complicated than it seems. Every problem has has more like nuance than yeah. it seems. Every solution has more caveats than it seems. Right. Um, there's almost no point in anything. Well said, Alex. That was our discussion <laughs> of the core coke. Uh, we got to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to review this wonderful tree. But we got to do so after some ads. Thank you for sitting through them. We love you. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Wow. Sorry, Casey. Is everyone okay? I just feel like my eyebrows just got singed. <laughs> Jeez. It's me trying to reverse engineer some energy. Um, welcome back to Completely Arbitrary. That was our discussion of the cork oak. Casey. Alex. It is time to give a review to this tree. Oh, I would love to. I'm quite excited for this. Here's how it works. We're going to get some final thoughts on the cork oak. Likes, dislikes, and then we're going to get a rating of 0 to 10 Golden Cones of Honor. If this is your first time listening, this is how we do things over here at Completely Arbitrary. This is how we do it. After these, after these rich discussions of these complicated ideas, it uh-huh. all comes down to a Golden Cone score. <laughs> Everything just boils down to Golden Cones, baby. It is all just arbitrary. It's just capitalism here. <laughs> Casey is our resident expert. You know what? You might be an expert, Mm -hmm. but more and more lately, I have felt capable. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is a big discussion we should have. You. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not an expert. Not even close. I mean, compared to compared to you, who have a you have a master's degree and a couple of bachelors, and I think (laughs) an honorary Harvard Law. Yeah, yeah, I I do. Uh, (laughs) Thank you, Alex. I'm I'm glad you know this. It's my dream to get an honorary law degree from Harvard, and Shaq gives it to me. That would be a dream. Um, I, I have I have felt more and more capable, and and yeah. uh, like I know more about trees than being like the dumb guy on the podcast. Wow, which he was my old an, character. You saw everyone; those were quotes. He had quotes around that season one. Season one, Alex. Wow. You know, we're in okay. season six. That is true. That Characters is true. change a lot over time. That's very accurate. Anyhow. Uh, as a resident expert, saying us having wow. said all that, we'll begin with you. Maybe now start saying as one of the resident experts. Ah, can I be an honorary? I've I've called myself an honorary arborist. Let me go. Let me go call Shaq. <laughs> yeah, we can get this done. If anything, I'm an honorary dendrologist. Yes, not correct. An arborist. Yes, all right. I'll take that. I'll take okay. That. Yeah, Casey, what's your uh, what's your thoughts? Your, okay, your score. My thoughts are so to get kind of back to this. Um, I know that you may not be able to apply this model of the Dehesas and Montados to everywhere. Yeah. But we could probably amp up how much we do use that in the United States and sure. Canada for certain by a significant degree. Yeah. And I think we should. So it's at least a model worth investigating and saying, okay, how can 
we we modify this to our area. All it takes is a single step in the right direction and yeah. you're on your way. And certainly Central California is so perfect for yeah. this. Yeah. It's so perfect. It's literally the same thing with right. different species of oak trees. Yeah. Like I cannot like I almost like have to just spit these words out. I'm so emphatic about wow. this. Like you can literally do a one to one with almost every different species from there to there. Cool. Anyway, I think the cork oaks are incredible trees. Mm. The very first one I saw was on Oregon State campus, and it blew my mind when I was like, wait, wait, cor- what? This is where cork comes from? <laughs> and whenever I learn about a uh, the product, rather the tree that we get a very common product from, like cork, oh yeah, cork, duh, what does it come from? And everyone's like, uh... I don't know. <laughs> like cinnamon is another one. Everyone's yes. like, well, where does cinnamon come from? You're totally. like, oh, it must be this. Yeah, it's just the bark of a tree. Yeah. So this is the bark of a tree. It is a sustainable practice. These trees will not be cut down. They are not being killed. They are done properly by professionals, and it's supporting this really cool model of how we could do uh, <clears throat> life, essentially. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really unique, and I think the tree itself, as the kind of pillar that is holding this whole thing up, is really beautiful. Yeah. The the tree itself is gorgeous. You should go find them and touch their bark any chance you get. It is a 10 out of 10 golden cones of honor for the bark. Alex oh. just got stunned because he thought I was going to go all the way up to 10 wow. out of 10. Wow, for the bark. Okay. Yeah, for the bark yes. specifically. Sure. Um, the rest of the tree um, see how it is. is being planted more and more around here in the Great Pacific Northwest because, again, uh, Sisters Nursery is saying, hey, we need to get some climate adapted species mm. that are evergreen because why are we planting deciduous trees in Oregon where we tend to get all of our rain when the leaves aren't there? So how are they really providing us rainwater benefits? You know? Interesting. So it's kind of this fun idea where if we have more evergreen species, then we can have better services and we also have more dense shade and they don't care a lick about the drought they're totally fine with yeah them. yeah yeah so they're just like these really really great trees they kind of grow funny though they don't have around here this beautiful form that you see in their native habitat they just kind of get a little straggly and kind of gangly and leggy they just they really don't have a beautiful form they can have a beautiful form and i'm waiting for them to get there so I'm going to give this tree a, I'm going to give a 7.5. Oh, wow. 7.505. 7.505. Just a little bit higher <laughs> than okay. 7.5. So gotcha. it rounds up <clears throat> at oh. the end of the day. Okay. It doesn't, but that's fine. It, wow. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> the five goes to a one. The one now goes to a five. Okay. You're right. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway. Um, yeah. So 7.505, because I think it is far more, uh, it's, it's a tree that I think, has a lot of symbolism as to, hey, you could kind of do it like this. I know we can't harvest yeah. or corn. I know we can't harvest cork from our native trees over here, but at least we can use them to support an ecosystem and make a living and a life off of that. I think that's really cool. Yeah. I think the trees themselves are beautiful in their native <laughs> habitat. Everywhere else that they are planted and they are underplanted, you should plant more if they are wow. good for your area. A rare one. They have a little bit to be desired, at least so far, with our, 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 our horticulture variety. I think we can really make them look way better. Cool. I don't know how. I don't know when. But it's not my job. I'm not a nursery yeah. man. Yeah. Someone else take care of it. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> anyway. Did you say nurseryman? Yeah. I was making a rhyme. I don't know, I don't know where. I don't know when. But I am not a nursery man. So uh. I should have said men. Nurseryman. You can, it's a near rhyme. Yeah. 7.5.05 from uh, Casey Clapp. No, 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 yes. no, no. Yes. Yes. Uh. <laughs> You're right. I feel like I just got hit by something. Uh. Throwing a cone at me real fast. Casey, shut up. The cork oak. I also remember finding out early on in the podcast that the thing we call cork, that we so lovingly pin our evidence for the serial killer yep. that we use in our sandals. Correct. That we use in our uh, floaty keychains so you don't lose your keys while you're fishing. That people use to stop wine mm-hmm. from spoiling mm-hmm. is from a tree? 
Same thing with cinnamon. You're right. That that is the other one that I was like, oh my god, that's so like, yeah, it's so hilariously and adorably simplistic. You, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, like oh, it's just cork. You just don't think about where it comes from. Yeah, and it's yeah. right there. It's on the tree. It grows on a tree. I mean, it's like it's it's out of a Dr. Seuss book or something. It totally like, is. We need some of this. Or, well, or let's like, take it off the tree. Like Willy Wonka, where you just like go and pluck something off of a tree totally. and it is that thing. You know? Yes. Yeah. Totally. Um, yeah, it's almost like a fruit or something. Like Kinda it can is, be yeah. used right away. Just grab it and you're good to go. Uh, this whole this whole farming practice. Um, what were they? What were they called? These these lands uh, in Portugal. Dehesa. Dehesa and Montado. Okay, I think these are just beautiful uh, templates for what we could be doing more of yeah. all across the world. I think the cork being from the cork is so hilariously simplistic. It's just really endearing. Oh boy. Yeah, seeing seeing the flayed man look with like it's almost like pushing up your sweater sleeves, you know, and you just yes. got your bare arms. Oh my god. <laughs> it, it is It's so funny. And they're like we never we didn't know this, but they're like bright red orange. Yes. Like they you look at it and you're like, oh my God, like what is the matter with those trees? Yeah, it's so interesting. Um it, yeah, it looks like a cross section in like an anatomy book or something. Yes, yeah, totally. It's exactly um, it. I I just really I really admire this tree and I admire what it gives us. I love a tree that gives back and I admire the farmers in Spain and Portugal that are like honoring that and taking care of these trees. And yeah, you have a huge fucking industry, but it's done in a way like that seems pretty fucking responsible and kind to the earth. Yeah. Um gosh, Casey it's in my heart. I give it a 9.0. Wow, Alex, that's beautiful. I actually thought you were going higher. You did? I did, yeah. When you give the bark a 10 out of 10. Yeah, the bark is really good. Okay, <clears throat> maybe I should go up to, maybe, no. should, maybe I'll change it to 7.9. 7.9? Yeah, I'm going to change it to 7.9. <laughs> okay. It's not, I mean, it's a, it's a fine tree. It's a fine tree. It is. It's a fine tree. I just can't, like, I love to see it. But there are so many other trees. I just the the majesty of it I'm kind doesn't of, quite get me there. I'm kind of giving it a my score in like its its Mediterranean proper. Range, yes. Okay. You know? I see. Yeah. Yeah. Which I um, have done a few times. I guess that I have experience with this tree. Kind of shapes that tree. Sure. Yeah. That was our review of the cork oak. What a lovely time. A lovely time. It is now time for our completely arbitrary Q and A. Casey, this week's question comes from. Longtime fan, I will say host favorite, Angie Smith. Oh, hey, Angie. Angie is one of our, our, our most hardcore fans. Angie shows up to every single live stream. That's right. Um, hi, Angie. Bonjour. Angie asks, what's your favorite place to eat in Portland? Whoa. Like your special treat place. Uh, yeah, so honestly, I think uh, I think you've had a similar question like this. Uh, I don't know if we covered oh, it on mainline. Oh, is it too line. similar? No, 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 okay. because these things change all the time. Sure. I need you to go first. I chose this because it's not, it's not strictly tree related. But it's Iberian pork related. <laughs> yes, I love I love going to the porqueria. Um, <clears throat> it is uh, it is it is adjacent at least. We talk about food a lot on this podcast. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, um, and normally this would be an episode that well, it is somewhat related to. Again, keep a keep uh, keep don't stay to the end. Oh, is there something happening at the end of this podcast? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Ex- Exciting. A little a little uh, 11th hour tease. Well, I teased it already. The very beginning. When? The very beginning. I said, if you stay till the end. I, I did surprise. not hear this. Wow. I tuned you out. Oh, my God. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> uh, my favorite. Okay. Special treat place. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. What I was going <clears> to <throat> say is, A, this is a little bit of a food eating related drinking thing. Yeah. It's also related to if we were smarter, we would have done this. Uh, during one of our food related things sure but this was uh, this is uh, we, we just put this one in because uh, it was in my heart listen we don't have an oversight committee no uh, that's Casey and I and <laughs> that we, is. we're already pretty busy <laughs> we just switch chairs <laughs> <laughs> um favorite okay so if I have a, like a special treat place yeah in Portland <sighs> It's probably going to be an expensive pizza. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. That expensive pizza is coming from Demos. Demos Pizza. A Demos a pizza is, and I yes, that's a pizza because it's oh, New, New yeah. Haven, Connecticut style. Just so funny. They call it a pizza over there. Okay. Um, it's my favorite pizza in Portland. I think it is almost a perfect ten out of ten. Mm. I don't, I don't know what I would change. Yeah. Every, it, I've only, I've only like, it's only missed once for me mm-hmm. out of the 
I don't know, a couple dozen times I've had it. Yeah. Um, if I'm feeling like dropping a little dough on something that I know is going to be, <laughs> that I know is going to be like really consistent, I'm going Eam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eam is like, I've talked about before, Eam is like, uh, Eam is like fast, is like a, a fast food chain in the sense that it's so aggressively consistent. Huh. It, you're just, you know exactly what you're going to get. Interesting. Um, Anytime you go, I've I've never had any like inconsistency there. That's a big yeah. thing for me for restaurants. Is like it is huge. Yeah, when you go time and time again, you want you expect it to be as good as the last time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Eam doesn't change their menu. They're not innovating over there, mm. but it is so it is so so good and so solid. Yeah. Now they did already innovate. Yes, this like is, the yeah. well, yeah. They it's like a it fusion place. Yeah. Um, it's it's a I think it's a collaboration between a Thai restaurant and a Southern barbecue joint. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it is so good, and it is just like exactly what it is each and every time. It is spendy. Yeah, I'll drop. But it's so good. I don't want to say. Um, it is very good. And then uh, my let's see, this might be like my my two big go tos if I'm really treating myself. Yeah. I think that's probably it. Do you have anything in your purview case? Honestly, I just I don't. I'm you, sorry. You don't have a special treat place? I don't. I don't really. I I the only thing I can say is after a long frisbee tournament, yeah. I tend to get sushi. I like sushi. Oh yes, yeah. But I also don't like spending a whole lot of money on sushi. Yeah. So if I do, I would probably go find a place that has better more high quality, high class sushi. Yeah. And I would go eat that. Okay. And that's one of my favorite things. <clears throat> Let me say this. Let me ask this. Please. I know that you are a burrito boy. Yes. Um, and as somebody like me who suffers greatly from gastrointestinal issues, mm -hmm. a burrito is pretty much a... a not um, starter. Yeah. It, it, can't, it doesn't happen. It can't happen. Although <laughs> it did happen recently. Nice. Um, well done. Thank you. Uh, what is your go-to burrito in Portland? Wow. We're talking the place... The, the meat Ooh. and the fillings. Like, what do you have in it? Well, I just recently had one of my favorite breakfast burritos uh, again for the first time in a very long time, which is from, I think it's called La Casita, which is a little food cart under a overhang on a parking garage next to PSU. So you know it's going to be good. It's so good. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I like them. They're very sweet people, and they make a big, big burrito. Hell yeah. I used to go to La another Casita. food cart on... Uh, Foster and 52nd Avenue, hmm. but I think it changed its name. It was, used to be called El Local, and it would be a habanero burrito, which Ooh. was not as hot, except for one time, and that was a horrible experience. Oh, jeez. We won't, we won't go into the details. <laughs> Speaking of gastrointestinal issues. Yeah. Um, but they just made huge, big burritos, and I would always get a carnitas i love mm, carnitas I think yes it's so good so so good um but shoot um i don't i don't really have a place i do love eam i think eam's fantastic yeah um i really like that but the we've been there together we have he was very good wasn't it mm -hmm. um sh oh, alex i don't know that's okay you've answered it plenty all right because i just your go-to burritos I'm, is what was i i was pitching that to you as your okay thank as your you. answer i really appreciate that <clears throat> i tend to not i tend to suck at getting good things like i just i'm not a foodie so like you and other people i've met they'll like go try specific restaurants yeah just to see what it's like and i would love to do that i just i just don't i don't know why it is i mean it's i i think if you don't have you love you like food yeah i do but yeah, you're not yeah. like crazy about it in the way that some like food enthusiasts are correct and it's yeah. a hard thing when you're not in that mindset to commit a bunch of money to because mm -hmm. it's like oh geez one meal is is that much yeah right um but it's it's you know as I've said before, it's more than about the food. It's about the experience. It's about the um, going somewhere and feeling like you're being, uh, like you're you're experiencing something that is like special. It's art, Casey. As, yes, as the chef yeah, is yeah. the artist. You're you're eating their art. It's very like, true. It's a wonderful thing. I will say though, I do like uh, my a pub uh, quite near where I live called mm. the Pocket Pub. Hey, and they make spectacular pizzas. Wonderful. Everything on their menu is delicious. So I, I would recommend that. Thank you so much, Angie. I could go on. We could. We can go on. We'll we have, have a whole we other episode to, about it. We'll just talk about food. I would love to. Living in Portland is a, is great for that. It really is. Um, if you have a question for us, 
Join up on the Patreon. It's the best way to support this podcast. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash arbitrary pod. A-R-B-O-R-T-R-A-R-Y pod. There's a bunch of different tiers for a bunch of different support levels, and you get item or you get a and you get rewards every month, including the crown jewel of the Patreon. Mm-hmm. The Cone of the Month Club. The Cone of the Month Club. That's right. You sign up for that. You get bonus episodes. You get access to uh, a monthly coupon for merch. You also get a sticker every single month sent to you in your mailbox. And it is illustrated by an independent artist of a conifer cone. That's right. We've gone through 33 different species so far, Casey. That's right. And we just sent out last month's, which is the Woolamai pine. That's right. And uh, I guess I say last month's uh, September's. Yeah. October's we've just ordered. So there's so many lucky people that are going to get a ghost pine yeah. here in a couple weeks. I'm excited for that one. It's going to be great. And then this month... What are we going to have now? Cryptomeria. Oh, the Sugi. That's right. How exciting. <laughs> I love the Sugi. Uh, so go to patreon.com if you want to support this podcast. Look for Completely Arbitrary or arbitrarypod.com. And go peruse that website. We spent a lot of time on it, and there's a lot of cool stuff on it. Yeah, there. we sure did. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff. Um, Casey Clapp. Alex <clears throat> Croson. It is time for the reveal. There is a reveal. I'm very excited. This is the whole reason I decided to do this tree. Wow. I wanted to pop the cork because we have celebrations to celebrate. Yeah. I can finally announce to the whole world that I am actually going to make a tree identification book. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. There's, a whole, there's everyone here. Woo! The producers, all, the, all my friends, all my family. Uh, you guys are the best. I'm very excited, Alex, and we just uh, finalized the, I uh, just signed the papers uh, That's right. with Mountaineers Publishing just yesterday. Wow. So it is very exciting, and for those of you who don't know, it's going to be an, a guide to how to identify trees, mm-hmm. and then all of the local common trees in the Pacific Northwest. It's going to be the ones that you will find if you walk out your front door, you go down your street, you're at your park, what trees are you going to see? Yeah. What are going to be there? Not the trees that you would necessarily find out in the wild woodlands. Not the trees you're going to find in natural areas, unless they're invasive trees, which also grow in the cities. It's a focus on urban forests. Exactly. So the whole scheme is to be a uh, user's, an uh, an accessible user's guide to how to identify trees. Yeah. And it's going to be from start to finish, how to do it, and then it's going to cover all these different species, closely related species, and give you almost literally anything you could ever want on ter- or in terms of what is that tree. The idea is you literally walk out your door, you see a tree, you pull this book out, 99% of the time it's going to tell you the tree that's in Hell front yeah. of you. Or help you get there. Casey, so I have uh, <clears throat> I have seen this journey of yours from your first, uh, maybe not your first, but early on saying, I want to write a tree ID book. Yeah. I want to write a tree ID book. I want to write a tree ID book. And I went... Yeah, right. Uh, you never will. <laughs> give me a nookie and kick me out the door. <laughs> I've never said that to you. I've always been encouraging. He has been. Um, and then, and then you know, you found a you found a publisher and you started working mm-hmm. on it. And it's been so exciting to see you on this journey. Thanks, Alex. And in a way, it's it's kind of just beginning. There's all these like refreshers, you know. Yeah, right. And I'm stoked to see this book in the wild. I hope I get a signed copy. You will. You'll get a signed copy. And. I'm really excited for my 20%. Oh, yeah. Wait. um, wait. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Completely Arbitrary. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. This is unfair. Completely Arbitrary is produced by Alex Croson and Casey Clapp. Our artwork is by Jillian Barthold, and our music is by Aves and the Mini Vandals. And you can support the podcast at patreon.com slash arbitrarypod. And find additional readings at completelyarbitrary.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>